Hey guys, it's Shaylin and I'm here today with another writing video. So in today's video, I, a literary magazine slush reader, am going to be telling you why your short stories keep getting rejected. Or not. I don't really know why your stories specifically keep getting rejected, but I'm going to be telling you the most common problems that I see in these stories that I read as a magazine slush reader. I've been a slush reader since last November and almost immediately I started to notice certain trends. Today I'm just going to be running through the most common issues that I see as a slush reader for a fairly high profile magazine I read for Prism International. But to be clear, I'm not going to be giving any examples or referencing anything specific about any of the stories that I've read because those are people's personal work. Even if you're submitting your work and it gets rejected, you're still doing so many great things by putting your work out there. It is ultimately very competitive. You know, even among the stories that get rated very highly, not all of them get published and a lot of them, you know, go on to still get rejected by the magazine at later stages. But I'm just talking about as a slush reader, when I'm doing that like initial scan, when I get a batch of 10 stories and I need to sort them into kind of the lower rated stories that are probably just going to get like auto rejected to the more higher ranked stories that are then going to go on to the, the editorial board. And then at the end, I just wanted to share five things that really make you stand out. The first really common problem that I see is that it's just not a story. We're just kind of following a character for a time, but there's no purposeful reason to it. There's no real reason why we're following this person or we're following this person for this period of time. It never goes anywhere. There's no sense of motion or development. There's no sense of change or revelation. It's just a lot of context and scenes that never build up to anything. This is really common. I cannot tell you the number of times that in my little review box I've written, this just doesn't go anywhere or this just doesn't amount to anything. This is very common where it's just not a story. You know, I don't get a sense that there's any reason why I should be interested in this person or this section of this character's life. Number two is that the narrative is too distant. This is really common. I'll say statistically that in a batch of 10 stories, I usually only get one or two in first person. Eight or nine of them are in third person. A lot of those third person pieces, like I would say the majority of them, have the issue of being too distant. The psychic distance is very far. There can be cases where distant third person can work well if it's done purposefully, but in most cases a closer third person, especially in a short story which by nature has a fairly like intimate type scope, usually creates a greater sense of immersion into the story. And I can't say honestly that I have encountered a single story in the slush pile where the distant third person was being done for a reason. It typically just feels like the writer is not skilled enough to write a closer third person. It makes it very hard to immerse in the story and especially alongside other stories which have more skillful use of point of view, these stories just end up feeling very flat and distant. Number three, end is actually the beginning. This happens more often than you'd think, where in a 10 page story, there isn't really an inciting incident. We get about eight pages of kind of wandering, meandering build up. On page eight or nine, we'll actually get the inciting incident, and then the story will end. So what has happened is the author has basically mistaken the story's inciting incident for the story's climax. And so they actually end the story after the inciting incident. I see this a lot. A story that is mostly context without really anything happening, and then something really interesting will happen at the very end, and then the story ends without any exploration to that thing. And I'm thinking, if this had been on page two instead of on page eight, it could be a really fantastic story. But the story is just beginning and ending in the wrong place. The next common mistake that I see is an absent protagonist or there is no sense of the protagonist and this is an issue that I typically see in third person. Again, this happens in this distant third person where the third person is so distant that we almost start skimming over the story and we completely lose sense of the protagonist. We might be told or established early in the story who the protagonist is, but you wouldn't know it because you don't feel their presence in the story, you don't have any sense of where they are physically in the story, it almost feels like we're told this is the protagonist and the story, the narrative drifts away so much, we don't even have any sense of this person being in the story. And so there is no real sense of character development, of psychological depth, character arc, because the story has gotten so far from the main character, the main character isn't even the main character. They're barely even a character in the story. We just kind of lose the protagonist. We don't have a sense of what they're doing, of what they're feeling, of what they're thinking, of who they are. 
because the story has gotten so far from them. Oftentimes we also, the narrative will be distant and so the narrative will start talking about things that wouldn't really be within the main character's frame of knowledge or things that feel very objective about other characters rather than telling the story through the protagonist's lens. And so we just don't really have a sense of the protagonist at all. Now the counterpoint to that that you see in first person is absent setting or storyline. The most common problem that I see in first person stories that I get, which are, I will say the minority, I don't get many first person stories, which surprises me. I would have thought it would be more 50-50, but I would say it's probably only like 10 or 15% of stories that I get there in first person. And I also do read CNF submissions, and so a lot of the first person submissions I get are CNF, so I don't get much first person fiction. But I would say that in the first person fiction that I read, one thing that's really common is the story gets so close into the point of view that we lose sense of the setting and we lose sense of what's physically happening. Like the story becomes disconnected from the physical happenings. So in third person, the common issue is it becomes so distant, we lose sense of the main character. Whereas in first person, we're so deep into the main character's perspective that we don't have any sense of how they're physically interacting with the world or what's actually going on. Both of these issues are kind of losing like the physical tangible choreo of the scene, but just for different reasons and they're very common problems. Number seven, familiar narrative element. The magazine that um, I read for Prism has a mandate to publish, you know, experimental work but I barely get any experimental work in my submittable inbox, which is unfortunate to me because I would love to get more experimental work. One really common thing will happen is I'll get a story that's like pretty competently written, the writing is good, there's maybe some really good detail choice, but the narrative elements are just so familiar and I just feel like it's a story that I've read many times before. Now sometimes I read stories that have a familiar element but manage to do something really unique with it. I read one recently that was on a very commonly written theme, but because of the setting and the situation, it felt so fresh. But a lot of the time I read stories that are competently written, but just feel very familiar in terms of what is happening on the page and in the story, and they aren't really unpacking anything new or fresh. You can definitely write stories that feel more subtle or grounded and are maybe been written before, but I think there needs to be something that pops that feels fresh within like the character or the narrative in some kind of insight. These are often the stories that I feel have very high quality in the writing, but the story itself just falls flat because it's entirely made up of narrative elements that have kind of just been done before so many times and there's nothing really new being said. Number eight is what I call the so what story. This is the story that just doesn't say anything. It may have the potential to engage with broader topics or themes, but it doesn't take those opportunities. A lot of the time in these stories, maybe there's an awareness that it should be engaging with this theme. And so in the very end, the author will kind of try to make a statement about the message or theme or, you know, take away or lesson, but it often feels very overt and very shoehorned in at the last second, rather than being like actually illuminated by the story itself. It ends up feeling a bit authorial. One thing that I often see in stories like this is a protagonist who is kind of just very judgmental of other characters but for no real reason and nothing is really learned or unpacked from that judgment. We don't really get any takeaway about the protagonist through these judgments. Nothing is really said or accomplished. We're kind of just watching a character be very judgmental of other people for no real reason. And I love a judgmental protagonist, but something has to be done with that. There has to be some reason why this extreme level of cr this critical lens is within the, the narrative POV. But a lot of the time in what I call the so what story, which is the story where I get to the end and I'm like, what was this trying to say to me? There's a character who's kind of just bitching about other people, but like for no real reason. And so at the end, I'm like, what was I supposed to take away from this? The next really common issue is the foggy plot. So this is where it's just unclear what was happening. It's very common actually for me to read stories in the slush and I'm like, what was, ha what happened in this? Like I completely lost track of what was happening because there was no clarity within the structure of the story, the lack of clarity story where it just becomes very confusing what is happening in the story. You can't keep track of what is happening in the story, but the narrative is just so confusing and kind of doesn't have any grounding points. And so kind of halfway through, I'll be like, what is happening in the story? I literally couldn't tell you. And in a lot of cases, I think with more clarity, these stories could be really excellent. Um, and a lot of them do have interesting writing, but it's just not grounded within like any kind of clarity that can keep the reader knowing what's going on. 
The next reason is that the story doesn't take itself seriously. I very commonly read stories where I feel like the tone is kind of undermining the story. I think in these cases the author's goal is to be like funny or satirical. I think these stories are meant to be comic or satirical, but they don't end up actually working because they aren't actually funny. Like there aren't actually jokes or wit or, you know, interesting social commentary. It just kind of makes the protagonist feel a bit pathetic, makes the stakes feel very low, and so it kind of ends up feeling like the point of the story is to just laugh at the protagonist. And so as the reader, I kind of feel like, well, why am I supposed to take this seriously if the story doesn't take itself seriously? You can absolutely write great comic pieces, but I think there has to be actual commentary or satire, and the comedy shouldn't be used to undermine the story itself. What happens in these stories is that there's just this very flippant tone that feels like it's laughing at the story. A lot of the time these stories just don't really fit the tone of the magazine that I read for, and so it feels like the author is maybe not very aware of our magazine's mission statement or hasn't read an issue before because this just typically isn't the tone that we publish. And the final reason why I personally, why I give stories a low rating, and this one I feel kind of bad, is just like general blandness. The story is just kind of eh. I get to the end and I might feel like that was competently written, but nothing about it stood out. Nothing about it popped. Nothing about it really interested me. Nothing about it felt fresh. Like it's just kind of generally bland. And that's not to say that your stories need to be extremely bizarre or experimental or strange. Some of the best pieces I've read from the slush have been very subtle. They have a freshness to them, an insight to them. So it's not that your story has to be extremely bizarre or strange or weird, although I do, to be honest, think that that can help you stand out in the slush pile. But I think a very common issue, and I see this in a lot of stories, where I'm just like, I, I wish I could give this a higher rating because the quality in terms of like line level is there. The story just feels kind of bland, like there's nothing really memorable about it. I quickly wanted to run through five things that I think make you stand out. First of all is a strong, close voice. I cannot tell you how much this is in your favor if your writing has a strong sense of voice and it's in intimate and it's immersive. So many stories in the slush have such distant voices that they don't feel immersive, they don't feel well developed. And so a strong, original, close voice is maybe the best thing you can have as a writer in the slush pile. From the first paragraph, before I even really know what the story is about, this will make a story stand out if I'm like, oh, this author has a really strong, well-developed voice. Number two is a story that quickly establishes its concept. A story that knows what it's about and is able to quickly establish that is really to your favor. I've read stories that I think are quite strong and I maybe would have given higher ratings, but they took too long to establish what they were about. If you can quickly establish the concept within the first page or ideally the first paragraph, that is so to your benefit because then as the reader, I'm not spending five pages going, I don't know what this is about or why I'm reading this. I know immediately what this is about and why I'm reading this. And I'm just kind of immediately on board and immediately engaged. In general, your short story's introductory section can be a lot shorter than you probably think. Your story probably barely even needs an introductory section. You can just begin with the inciting incident in most cases. That is really to your benefit and a lot of the strongest pieces I've read in the slush are the stories that established what they were about on page one and that came along with a really well-developed voice. Number three is nuance, perception, and insight. I cannot tell you how important this is. This can be the difference between a story that is just kind of bland, boring, underwhelming, I'm not gonna remember it, to a story that leaves a deep impression on me as a reader, and that's the story's ability to be insightful and nuanced. Even if you have a very low, quiet concept story, if you're able to pick out nuance and insight and find interesting things to say throughout the story, I am engaged as a reader, even if the story is very, very quiet and very, very low concept. A perceptiveness to the writing really lends you so much credibility as the writer. If I feel the writing is perceptive to its characters and it's saying things that I'm like, oh, I never thought of that, 
I feel like I'm getting something out of this story and that can be the difference between a story that I get to the end and I'm like so what was the point of that and a story that I get to the end and I'm like writing to the editor please publish this because this is really good is a story that is perceptive and insightful because that kind of fixes the so what problem because you're providing me these little bits of insight throughout. Number four is movement. A story that has change arc movement, it doesn't have to be any kind of traditional narrative structure. What I am aware of is if the story feels like it's not moving versus if I feel continual movement and development and change. That's how I feel like I'm reading a story versus being just shown a character in a situation, but it's not really a story yet. And finally, number five is originality and playfulness. Originality is huge because like I said, so many stories tread very familiar ground and if they don't have that insightfulness, the story just feels very bland. If you have an original concept, an original voice, just something to the story that feels playful and original and I feel like it is doing something fresh that I haven't seen before, that is so to your benefit. That really makes you stand out from the batch because in a batch of a bunch of stories that are kind of bland and treading familiar ground, if one of them is original, whether it's like overtly weird or surreal or experimental, or whether it just has a really fresh voice that I feel like this is an author's voice I haven't read before and I want to hear what they have to say, that really immediately makes you stand out. So those five things I would say really make you stand out because they're things that I don't see that often. To me, they are really the sign of a story that has something to say and is original and that is, especially the magazine that I read for, that is what we are looking for is like original work that is doing something fresh and original and engaging. A story that is technically well constructed and has polished writing but isn't saying anything new or fresh is probably not going to get published. It's probably not even going to make it past the first round. Just a base level of being well constructed is is not enough. So those are things that help you so much in the slush pile because the majority of stories do not have them. When I see those things, I get so excited. I really remember those stories. And I just wanna say as a final disclaimer, even if your stories are getting rejected, it doesn't necessarily mean they have these problems. Again, this is me talking as a slush reader. Like this is the initial, pruning, right? And then those like stories that you give four and five rating go to the genre editor and still most of them don't get published. So there are stories that are doing those five things I talked about at the end amazingly and they still don't get published. So many amazing stories don't get published. I'm not saying that if you're continually getting rejected you necessarily have these problems. If you feel like these problems are like you're like oh maybe I have these issues in my writing that may be a reason why you're getting rejected because I would say these are the most common reasons why at the first reader stage I reject stories but there are plenty of stories that avoid these problems and are doing those things that make you stand out well and they still don't get published just because the magazine has, has loaded space and a lot of the time it does come down to like issue fit as well so thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in another writing video bye